and gentlemen, I'm pleased and proud to welcome to the stage Everett Stern. Everett. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. The big green one. OK, sounds good. Thank you. So um, I just want to thank everybody uh, for having me here today. It's just an absolute honor. Um, yeah, I remember seven years ago, um, me standing here in front of you all was definitely uh, not part of the plan and part of the picture. So I kind of want to start from the very beginning and share with you kind of a, 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 the real story of what happened behind HSBC, what Netflix didn't show, what Rolling Stone didn't show, because th there's, there's a very human element to this, and there's a very human element behind fraud and um, not doing something right. And um, I, I kind of want to you know, just inject that, that human element and consequences to doing the right thing, because I'll tell you right now that one, it's not easy, and two, um, you know, I took a major hit, meaning I was punished very severely for doing the right thing. So I'm not going to stand here telling you that you're going to get some big reward, and everyone I'm sure is going to ask me at the end, how much reward money did you get out of this? But what uh, you have to understand is I never pictured myself as a whistleblower, and I don't picture myself as a whistleblower even now, um, because I'm still fighting the battle. So that video you just saw of me, um, me, I don't like watching it myself because I'm not, uh, I'm more of a humble type person and I hate watching myself on TV and all these different news channels. But um, that was actually from the 2016 uh, United States Senate race in Pennsylvania where I ran for US Senate. Uh, and actually now, I'll announce to you now, uh, which I was actually going to announce next week, but I'm actually now running for U.S. Congress in Pennsylvania again. So I continue the fight. So it's not that I'm stopping um, and I, was a whist I blew the whistle and I stopped. Uh, and just to let you know, uh, and this has not been reported in the media, I'm not sure if Politico reported this, but when I, the reason why I ran for U.S. Senate in 2016 at 32 years old, I knew I was going to lose. There was, there was no question I was going to lose that race. And I spent $75,000 of my own money. You can look it up on Open Secrets. And the reason why I ran, though, was to send a message. Because my opponent, I'm not going to say the gentleman's name, but the senator I was running against was accepting money from HSBC, PAC, and he sat on the Senate Bank Financing Committee. And I, as the whistleblower, or someone who stood up, it's kind of a David and Goliath type story, had a problem with that. And I wanted to send a message to young people especially that when, when something like this happens, we're not going to be sold out anymore. And I didn't take other people's money because I knew that I was going to lose. And I, I felt it was unethical to take one dime of anyone else's donation money. And I ran against a senator, and I lost miserably, and I got made fun of horribly. People were like, oh, this guy, Everett Stern, this whistleblower, this, this, this crackpot, he just ran against a senator for, for no reason <laughs> and lost. But no, there was a real reason. And it was more of an internal reason for me personally. And we're going to get into that. But what I want to get into is the first slide here, which is very important, is that the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. And this is very, very important, because the people who look on and do nothing are just as culpable as the ones who are sitting there and actually committing the crime. At least that's my opinion. You in this room, I'm not here to tell you what to think. So you can think whatever you want. But to me, this is, this is my opinion. I happen to agree with Albert Einstein on this. And I think Albert Einstein was a pretty smart guy. So let's talk about. Before we get into the challenges facing, well, yeah, let's talk about the challenges facing compliance officers uh, today. So one, a compliance officer has a very unique role. And I don't know how many of you in here are compliance officers or fraud officers, but you have an interesting role because the bank or the financial institution employing you is, is hiring you to stop fraud or to stop financial crime. 
Yet at the same time, they want to make a profit and open up as many accounts as possible. So it's a real job with a major conflict of interest. And it's very difficult because where's that line? Where do you draw the line and say, okay, you know what? My financial institution's going too far. And you know, actually maintaining an ethical responsibility that conflicts with the, with the business's agenda. So you have the code of ethics of your corporation or entity, and then you have your own personal code of ethics. And that's something very important that you should leave, that what I want you to leave after this talk is where is your own code of ethics? And I can't provide that to you. I can't. There's no way. Who am I? Uh, I'm not someone, I'm not a higher power to give you a code of ethics. This is something every individual in this room has their own little defined code of ethics or rule that they abide by. And, it, and everyone in this room is going to be, diff is going to be different than another one. So the, again, the question raised, and we're going to try to answer this by the end, is when do you pull that trigger? When is it too far? And really what it comes down to is, and what I really want to drive home, is that it comes down to when it's too far for you. Not when something's wrong and it's too far for somebody else, or not too far for your bank or your institution, but when is it too far for you as an individual and a person? And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about this human element. So, again, when to take that whistleblowing step. But I want to be clear in that I'm not a whistleblower. <laughs> in that a whistleblower is somebody who blows the whistle, goes to the SEC, and you know, files some paperwork with a whistleblowing law firm, and calls it the day. That's not what I did. And that's not what anybody in this room should be doing, or anybody who works for any financial institution should be doing, or anybody in the United States or on this planet should be doing. Everybody should be fighting for justice on a nonstop, 24-7 basis. That's what should be happening. And again, I'm not perfect. I'm not sitting here as some angel telling you this, but I am, I am sitting here telling you what should be. And again, I have my own personal faults, but anyone can tell you, ask my mother. I have tons of personal faults. I was a very difficult child to raise, trust me. Imagine, H imagine the problem I caused HSBC. Imagine the problem I caused my family. So the risk that an organization is exposed to by criminal activity. So obviously we have negative PR, negative impact on the company. You know, you get fined, jail time, which did not occur in HSBC's case. HSBC was a very unique case where it was the largest fine in US history, $1.92 billion, but nobody went to jail. So all of my evidence, which we're going to get into, and I'm going to dive into little, the nitty gritty nooks and crannies of how this happened. But the Justice Department, nobody went to jail because the Justice Department felt that if, if a banker went to jail, it would cause a financial crisis. And they didn't want to risk it. Based on the amount of terrorist financing that I saw at this bank, we're, we're talking in the range of probably close to a billion dollars in terrorist financing. I can tell you right now that the risk of a financial crisis of another 9-11 happening as a result of HSBC's actions, that is the biggest concern. So not throwing one of these bankers in jail is a huge problem, and it sends a message to all the other banks out there that, you know what, you can go ahead and do business with terrorists and drug cartels, and we're just going to fine you, and it's going to be a cost of doing business. And that's what these fines have become. And you see it in the papers, like every other week now. Standard Charter is getting fined. Deutsche Bank is getting fined. Bank after bank. And nobody seems to care anymore. What's a couple hundred million to pay? $1.92 billion to HSBC was five weeks of their profit. That was nothing. Their stock went up. They, everyone got bonuses. I did them a favor. So the HSBC story, OK? So here's what, let's start from the very beginning here, in that when I was in college and grad school, I was a candidate for the, for the clandestine service. And this is talked about in Netflix a little bit. And the clandestine service is field operations for the CIA. And I was rejected from this program. And I want to make that very clear, because the media has asked me this time and time again. And I say, no, I am not a CIA agent. In fact, an FBI agent a couple months ago asked me, are you a CIA agent? And I said, no, 
The FBI is still trying to figure it out. But the, the point is, is that I uh, was rejected from, from the clandestine service program, and I was trying to find jobs, and I got hired by HSBC as an anti-money laundering compliance officer. And my job was to, was to detect suspicious activity. And but it was really weird, though, because when I showed up on the job interview, um, I was told there was a cease and desist order on the bank. But first, my job interview wasn't at a bank. It was in this one-story shopping center in the middle of Newcastle, Delaware. And there were, I'll never forget, there were, it, it was, the walls were half painted, the cubicles were, weren't set up. I mean, you want to talk about a boiler room type situation. It was really, it was really bad. I thought I was going to get mugged. So it was amazing because there were maybe 15 compliance officers in the whole department. And I worked in the correspondent banking division. So what correspondent banking is, is when you want to get money from one part of the world to another, banks need to have a connection. So let's say you're banking at Wells Fargo and you want to get money to Kariba Supermarkets in Gambia that's banking with Standard Chartered Bank. But Wells Fargo doesn't have a direct connection to Standard Chartered Bank. So who do they go to? They have to go to a broker of these deals and they go to HSBC. Why do they go to HSBC? Because HSBC is the world's largest bank. They're international, they're everywhere, they're in every foreign country that the United States will not do business with. And I, I mean, they are the world's, they're the bank's bank. And they are the largest correspondent banking division in the world. So in 2010, when I got interviewed though, I interviewed with a former counterintelligence FBI agent. And this was very interesting as to why HSBC hired a former FBI counterintelligence agent to interview his employees and run the, the compliance department. Now, I don't know if you know what a counterintelligence agent does, but they hunt spies, okay? So me coming into this, this was not a good situation, but I didn't, I didn't go into HSBC to spy. I came in to do the best job possible. I came in in the interview, they kept asking me, what do you know about money laundering? Nothing. What do you know about SARS or writing SARS? Nothing. What do you know about treasury or what do you know? I was an idiot. I didn't know anything. I was right out of business school. I had no idea about any of this stuff. I had no idea about compliance. I didn't even know what a compliance officer really did. But this is what they wanted. This is why they hired me. And eventually they even put me in charge of Middle Eastern transactions, which is insane <laughs> because I really didn't know what I was doing. But unfortunately for HSBC, I'm a fast learner. And what I did was I went to the University of Delaware Library and I checked out a whole bunch of books and I started teaching myself money laundering and I used to wake up early in the morning and I used to read books on money laundering and I figured out um, a lot of stuff and uh, yeah, they got screwed. But uh, so <laughs> anyways, um, so I was the first wave in to help HSBC relieve this, this cease and desist order. Now, eventually the department got much, much bigger, but it was three weeks in on the job, I sent my first email to the CIA. And this email was actually leaked online. You can actually find it. But this email was sent, I believe, on November 10th or November 12th um, and of 2010. And I sent it to my former CIA recruiter. And the reason why I did that was because I found something very, very suspicious. Um, and what I found was, was that, well, basically, uh, so anytime I was working on a case and if you file a SAR, which is called, which is a suspicious activity report, if you file a SAR, it's supposed to go into a thing called a wire filter. And in this wire filter, then any future payments get stopped from coming into the bank and the bank cannot do business or any more wires with, with that entity. Also anything on the OFAC sanctions list which is basically any type of um, 
you know, enemy country, Russian mobster, any bad guy you can possibly imagine, terrorist organizations, drug cartels, the Zeta, Sinanoa, Hamas, Hezbollah, these all organizations and all their entities that do business with them go into the vaccinations list and then go into the wire filter. And what I noticed was something very strange, was that payments or wires were still going through. And I didn't understand this. And this was three weeks in, and there's maybe 15 compliance officers there, and they gave me access to basically everything. So just so you know, if you're here for cyber, to prevent cyber crime and, you know, espionage and things like that, definitely don't give your employees access to everything, because that's not a good idea. <laughs> so, um, but in my case, they gave me access, and I saw there's, I mean, just all these transactions, and I noticed that what I figured out was that, so for instance, there's a company called Tajico, called T-A-J-C-O. You can look this up online, and it's owned by the Tajain brothers, which are financiers for Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization, okay? They're actually backed by, by Iran. And Hezbollah is responsible for blowing up American soldiers um, by financing IEDs, and, which is, you know, improvised explosive devices on the side of the roads of Afghanistan and Iraq. So when you see that soldier with the limb blown off, it's most likely responsible from Hezbollah. And you can probably count on that financing, actually, from coming from HSBC Bank. And I can say that with pretty much certainty from based, based on what I saw there. And with having to do with, with Tajiko was I saw in the wire filter it was spelled differently. It wasn't spelled T-A-J-C-O. It was spelled T-A-J dot C-O. And then there was another line in the Excel spreadsheet that said T-A-J dash C-O. And, and then a hyphen. And then I realized what they were doing. And the, the, the FBI later, later named it as stripping the payments. But they were miscoding the names because the wire filter at HSBC requires an exact match. And if you ask any HSBC employee here, they'll tell you the same thing. That it requires an exact match, and if you put in these dots and dashes, then the payments will go through. And that's how hundreds upon millions of dollars got, uh, were, were facilitated and, and were wired for Hezbollah and for this Tajiko, which owns Kariba Supermarkets, which operates out of Gambia and Sierra Leone. And this is a big deal because, um, well, we'll get, we'll get into that in a, little, in a little bit. But basically, this is what I uncovered, which was this huge money laundering, terrorist financing, drug cartel, just criminal manipulation. And I want to make very clear to you that adding these dots and dashes into the payments and, and, and into the wire filter, this was not by accident. This was intentional. So this was criminal manipulation of the wire filter. So, which is, which, is, which is illegal. Now, I couldn't go to the FBI, and this is an important part of the story. I could not go to the FBI, because the FBI, counter, former FBI counterintelligence FBI agent, was running the department. So I felt the FBI was compromised. Now, are there a lot of good FBI agents? Absolutely, I, I love the FBI. Especially, I don't wanna get arrested, and I love them. But at the same time, my being a former candidate for the clandestine service and seeing that this was a national security issue, I decided to go to the Central Intelligence Agency. And these transactions involved terrorist organizations and drug cartels, and the CIA needed to be notified of this. Um, and again, I didn't know who this person who ran my department knew. And so I'll never forget the night, though, that I wrote the, the, that I wrote the actual email to the CIA. I'll never forget it. And this is the, probably the most important part of the whole story. Because I was laying in bed, and I had this great job out of school. I was being paid like 60K a year, which I know to a lot of you in this room probably doesn't seem like a lot of money, but someone right out of school, to me it was a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, and I guess I, I didn't know what to do, because I knew if I headed down this path that it was going to lead to disaster, and my parents were so proud of me, 
that I got this great job with this big bank, and you know I was starting to make friends there. Three weeks in, I, I was you know I was part of a community. Like I, I they put me through the training, I, I, the partial training, whatever training they, they said. You know, it wasn't it wasn't real training, but it was um, <laughs> it was kind of like we sat in a in a conference room and they just said you're an anti-money laundering compliance officer and waved the wand and kind of hit us in the head. But the thing is, is that I, I felt I felt the sense of being part of something greater than myself. And I laid in bed and I knew what was going to happen if I sent this email. And I wrote the email out and I remember at two o'clock in the morning, I hit send. And I hit send, which, changed, which altered the complete course of my life. And the reason why I hit send is because of a poem I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation. But it's how you define success. And I remembered in, in college, my dad gave me this framed success poem by Emerson. And at the end of it, it talked about, you know, success was really about having a, you know, living a life and having, and at the end, being able to make one life breathe easier because you've lived and to have had a, you know, made a redeemed social condition, and that making one life breathe easier because I lived, that's what got me. And, and I had this, this, um, this, this, this framed poem that my dad gave me in my cubicle at HSBC, and, and everyone laughed at me, actually, because it was like I was in this little tiny cubicle, and I had this giant frame in, in there, and they were like, I thought I was some elitist or something, but anyways. Um, so, but I knew where these transactions were going. These transactions were going towards terrorism. And the thing is, is that I knew that wars cost money. And if you cut off the money supply, then we'll win. And I knew if I kept my mouth shut, that even though the consequences, which I knew we were going to be severe. I didn't think we were going to be as severe as it turned out to be. But it, 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 I, I knew people were going to end up getting killed. And that's how serious this was. So a lot of people will equate money and white coward crime and fraud as not being that big of a deal. When actually it is. Because bombs, bullets, all these things cost money. And terrorists and drug cartels, they want U.S. dollars. They covet U.S. dollars. Because that's the ultimate money supply for, for them. That's, I mean, they, they're, they're using our own money against us. So let's move on. So again, what is money laundering? And again, I'm not going to go into the details of what is money laundering. Um, because, because I'm not here to give you a lecture on exact money laundering. But overall, what I want to explain is that money laundering is, is basically concealing the source of, of where the money is coming from. Okay, that's what you need to know here. And for the purposes of this talk, what I want to do is, little, is, is just kind of describe a certain situation where, let's say Tom Field here, he's the focal entity of a transaction. And he's sending money to this whole table over there, all those people, okay? And it's actually a thing called smurfing, which is a type of money, type of money laundering. So he's, he, he's sending money underneath the, 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 the 10K trigger. And the 10K trigger means where if it's $10,000, you have to report that to the Treasury, right? Because that's what you have to do. It's a law. So some people will send money wires for $9,999 to not be detected. Now, what happens is in anti-money laundering compliance programs, they design rules so when a rule, when, when someone does that, it breaks the rule and alerts the system, and it, an alert is generated. Very, very important. And we've already discussed correspondent banking, and we've already touched on why is HSBC the premier source for drug cartels and terrorist organizations, because they're positioned all over the world to be able to be the conduit and to actually wire the money. So being the correspondent bank is what allows the terrorist organizations and the drug cartels to move the money. And also HSBC, the biggest reason why they are the number one go-to place for terrorists and drug cartels is because HSBC reps and personnel 
no disrespect to the HSBC people here, but they'll normally look the other way. And I know this because I saw it with my own eyes. So, and also HSBC admitted to everything I'm telling you right now, by the way. So this is not like I'm just saying this out of allegations and I'm just you know, pulling this stuff out of thin air. No, as part of the deferred prosecution agreement, HSBC admitted to all of everything I'm telling you, all of my evidence they admitted to. That was part of the $1.92 billion fine was that they had to say, yep, we did all this stuff. And you can read it in the sub uh, Senate committee report where HSBC executives actually admitted to all of this. And what's funny is actually is that HSBC never knew that I was passing information to the CIA for over a year until after the Senate committee uh, was hearings were done, which was, which was great because it was a nice surprise for them. But it was definitely, um, and, and let me comment on that further because the media has asked me about this. Yes, I did pass information to the CIA for over a year, and the word is pass. I was not an asset. I was not paid. I was not anything. The CIA did not conduct dom domestic intelligence operations against HSBC. That's very important I state that because according to a law passed by Reagan, the CIA cannot operate on domestic soil. I was not a CIA operative or did anything for the CIA on their behalf. I did this self-directed because it was the right thing to do. And to be honest with you, yes, I borrowed a lot of information from the bank. I, mean, I don't know if borrowing is the right, the right word, but I definitely took a lot of information. But it was for national security. Because people ask me, they say, you know, what do you think of Snowden? Or what do you think of you know, Julia Assange or these other whistleblowers out there? I'm not the same type of whistleblower. It's different. I didn't take information from the bank to profit from it. I took information from the bank to save American lives. That was my objective. That was it. It was for national security purposes. I never, I never profited from any of this. So let's talk about the anti-money laundering compliance systems. This is important you guys understand this. There's, because this, I want to break down for you now the guts as to how HSBC defrauded the United States government. Because right now, in this conference, what I've heard so far is tech, about technology. And I want to show you how technology can be used for good and how it can be used for bad and for evil. And what HSBC did by using technology, they defrauded the United States government and defrauded all of you. And, and resulting in the deaths of American soldiers. So you had the alert monitoring system, which is the first AML system that was created by HSBC Bank. And there were different types of alert alerts. That, uh, you, had, you had you could clear alert, you could put it on SAR, you could put it on watch. And writing SARS is very, very important. A suspicious activity report needs to be written because that's the intelligence that goes to the Treasury Department, which then goes to the FBI, the CIA, you know, all different types of, intel of intelligence community or law enforcement agencies. So SARS need to be written. HSBC did not want SARS to be written, though, in this time period because a SAR takes time to write. They had a major backlog of alerts at this time, hundreds upon thousands of, of, of alerts. And if they didn't clear them, according to the cease and desist order, they could lose their banking charter. So what HSBC did in order to clear all these alerts, in this building, this, this not a bank, but this one-story shopping center, there was, and on the right side of it, actually, there were about 300 debt collectors for the HSBC credit card. So HSBC had this brilliant idea of firing all these debt collectors and then rehiring them the next day as anti-money laundering compliance officers. And I'm not kidding. They, they actually admitted to doing this. And I remember these guys coming over with these baggy jeans and, and, and headphones, and they were just their mouses just clicking away all day, clearing alerts. They didn't even know what they were clearing. They were just approving everything. And, and I remember that I, I kept trying to, to, to get SARS Written. And I went to management over and over and over. And I want to make clear, I didn't go to the US government just to go to the US government. I didn't just blow the whistle. I first went to management over and over again. But within that three week time before I went to the CIA, and also I kept doing it throughout. And throughout, 
it was made very clear to me that HSBC does not want to um, take part um, in, in having a legitimate anti-money laundering compliance program. And they also created a bonus-based program or an incentive-based compliance program. So the more alerts you cleared, the more you got paid, which doesn't make any sense, right? It's supposed to be the quality of what you're investigating. And also, they didn't care what was in the narrative. So an alert comprised of an actual narrative or an actual investigation, right? And this so-called investigation, all you had to do is find the company's website or find some individual on Google Maps or something and just show that they were on a residential, um, you know, show they were an apartment building or show it had somewhat of a legitimate looking website and you didn't know what the website had to do. You run them through WorldCheck. On WorldCheck, it shows there's no hits. You just PDF that, attach that to the report, and then you would go ahead and you would uh, run a LexisNexis, but they didn't teach us how to work LexisNexis, so you would just PDF that you actually ran the search. All they wanted to see was they wanted to show the regulators that they tried to, to make an investigation happen. They didn't actually try investigating and getting things done. And that was, was very criminal. And by the way, the entire time I was there, I never saw one regulator. So again, we're talking about rules. Now, one thing they did with, with, with technology was they invented a new type of AM, AMS system, an alert monitoring system called NORCOM. And what NORCOM allowed you to do was to clear alerts in mass. Now, this is very, very important because it, having to do with this focal entity with Tom and that table over there, sorry, guys, I don't mean to make you guys the bad guys, but what NORCOM would allow you to do is if I were to clear Tom and find that Tom runs this organization, I could then automatically clear every single alert that has to do with all of those names at that table and the whole system. And this, is, this was perfect for HSBC. It was customized and designed that way because they had to clear a massive amount of alerts and they had to do it in, in, with the most alerts as possible in each transaction. And then they kept coming up with different rules. So then they said that bank-to-bank -bank transfers could automatically be approved. So if you had a bank-to-bank, -bank, you just clear all the bank-to-banks. So because it was an incentive-based program, investigators would actually get to work early to clear as many bank-to-banks as possible. It was incredible. We would actually steal alerts from each other. And then it was a situation where they would say that, this, that Mexico was a low-risk country, so it wouldn't produce as many, as, as many alerts. They would keep changing things around. The country risk ratings and quality assurance. There was no quality assurance. Until much, much later, there was a quality assurance team. But again, they weren't checking as to whether or not you were conducting an investigation. What they were checking was whether or not, it was whether or not the right PDFs were attached to the actual alert or the investigation. So let's talk about, you know, again, we talked about uh, that how we went from to 300 AML officers in a day, and the different types of uh, situation. So we talked about Tajiko and Kariba supermarkets. And you can look this up online, and I encourage you to do it. There was Charbonny Fruit, which was a fruit company, I call it the killer fruit company, that was sending money to the Muslim Brotherhood. And you also had situations of, you know, foundations in the Gaza Strip. And it was actually very interesting, so I wrote an email called Compliance Error, and I sent this to management notifying them that Hamas is a terrorist organization because these debt collectors who came over as anti-money laundering compliance officers didn't understand that. And they said, no, they were an elected organization, and management agreed with them. And I said, no, according to the State Department, Hamas is a terrorist organization. And they said, you know, no, and they threatened, actually threatened to fire me uh, over that email. It was, it was, I was hitting my head against the wall, believe me. Um, so what's important here, again, is, is why does any of this matter? And it matters because terrorist activity costs money. And the 9-11 Commission estimates that 400,000 to 500K, that's all it costs to, to take down the world trade. 
That's it. And actually, the 130K of that money was bank to bank wires that HSBC would just approve. So we're setting ourselves up for another 9 11. And, and again, I'm not just saying that, saying this as some, as some nut that's out there with conspiracy. I'm telling you guys this as someone who has literally seen all of these transactions and saw all this stuff. And it's scary to me. So the $1.92 billion fine. Now, here's where it gets interesting. This is where I ended up. This was my reward. I ended up in this 400-square-foot apartment living on a cot as a federal witness. This is where I ended up, driving a Hyundai. This is, this is, this is my life. And, and you'll see that, that little framed, and, and if you look at the, the, the photo, um, on the bottom right, you'll see the square, um, the square frame on the wall. That's the success um, poem I had. And that's what kept me alive. But I have to admit, there was a certain moment, and I'm going to be very candid with you, where after the deferred prosecution agreement, at this time I was working with the FBI, and on that fold-out table on my desk, you'll see I bought that at Walmart for like, I don't know, 20 bucks. And I wrote the intelligence report, HSBC Financing Terrorism. And that's when I went to the FBI. And that's what triggered all this in motion. And, and you see, I, I had the American flag there, because that was one thing that kept me going. But I slept on that cot. And as you can tell from these photos, I didn't get much dates for a long time. Um, and, and also, you know, I remember an FBI agent called me and said, Everett, I'm sorry, the deferred prosecution agreement went through, which meant that there was the $1.92 billion fine and nobody was going to go to jail. And I'll never forget that moment. And my heart sank. And because I, I fought so hard and, and I sacrificed so much, nobody, you know, you have to understand, at this point in time, all my friends abandoned me. Everyone thought I was a nut. This guy's going up against some big bank, this and that. I mean, it, it was this, this whistleblower. It was a horrible situation. He was passing information to the CIA. What is he talking about? I mean, obviously, it, it, you have to understand. I mean, if HSPC didn't admit all this, I would sound pretty crazy to you. I'd probably sound nuts already. So... It, 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 and I'll never forget, and I said to the FBI agent, I said, Is there, isn't there anything you can do? I said, look what these people are financing terrorism. And the, he said, Everett, our hands are tied. And I'll, ne and I'll never forget, it would me say drink of water. So I'll never forget that I, uh, I was sitting at that plastic fold-out table with a 9 millimeter, and I was going to kill myself. And I'd be candid with you on this. This is how personally I took it. Because you have to understand, for a year and a half of my life, I was passing information to the CIA. I was doing it in secret. And I was doing, I fought for the US government in a, in, in a very ri high risk situation. It was very dangerous what I was doing. Obviously, I was naming and going after a specific entities and individuals. It wasn't like I just went after um, Hamas or Hezbollah, I was going after specific entities, and you can Google my name, Everett Stern, and see the people that, are, that come up, um, and, you know, the drug cartels, and, you know, um, I'll never forget, and I didn't do it because of that poem, and I had my, my rabbit, actually, I had a pet rabbit, and this was the rabbit, the rabbit represented pure innocence and goodness, and I was like, who's going to feed the rabbit? That's why I asked myself. That's funny. It's what saved my life, the rabbit. And that's why I named my company Tactical Rabbit. And I started a private intelligence agency. Um, and I started actually waiting tables at P.F. Chang's at night. And I decided no one's going to help me. The government's not going to help me. The FBI, the CIA, they were, they were going to abandon me. So I waited tables at night at P.F. Chang's. And I had started my own private intelligence agency. And I turned it into... Um, a multi-million dollar organization. I mean, it took me a long time to do it. But, um, you know, it's a team of uh, former CIA officers. Um, and 
uh, you know, with the goal of promoting goodness and defending goodness, and that's why the name is Tactical Rabbit. And, um, but, but again, I, what I want you to see is, you know, uh, and that's why, again, ran for U.S. Senate, I'm running for Congress now, because I'm legitimately trying to make a difference. I'm not a whistleblower. A whistleblower blows the whistle and walks away. Um, and can one person make a difference? I get, yes. Did anyone go to jail in an HSBC case? No. I consider personally, I consider myself a failure for not putting someone in jail. That's how personally I take this case. But can one person make a difference? Yes, because it's the message that is sent. It's the David and Goliath that, that, that you will not stand and let, let, let terrorist financing or drug cartel financing or wrong go. You just won't ha let it happen. And you have the ethical duty to make this world a better place. And this is the actual poem. I want you to read this and, it, and have it burned into your mind because this is the most important. What is success? To laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate the beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. So do I judge myself based on my multi-million dollar company? No. I judge myself based on that night where I was sleeping in a cot for almost two years, and I judge myself based on that night I was tossing and turning before I wrote that email to the CIA. And I tell, I'm telling you, every single one of you in this room, if you see something, do something, because yes, you can make the difference, and you must make that sacrifice. And now I'll take any questions from the audience. We do have time here to take a couple of questions. David's got a microphone right there. Put a hand up. We'll get the microphone over to you. Right over in the far corner over there, David. Coming. Be a, be a speedy tactical rabbit. Come on, you can go faster. I can. Hi, I'm just curious. Um, how did you manage to get onboarded in your, in your new role, get access to systems, learn what money laundering is, find the suspicious transactions, reach out to management, and get a reply from management within three weeks? That's a great question. Um, so what I ended up doing was this stuff that I was seeing was so blatant. In HSBC, because they only had 15 compliance officers, I didn't really know what I was doing, but at the same time, if you see the words, you know, Hezbollah or, um, well, let me, let me break it down even, even smaller. Because I have two brain cells in my brain and I had access to Google. So if you see a name and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrorist organization, you Google it and the entity is somehow affiliated, and then I would walk three cubicles over to my manager, because there was only 15 of us, and I would say, this is a terrorist, can I SAR them? They would say no. And then, um, you know, money laundering, I went on Wikipedia again, looked up Wikipedia, went through, again, I didn't become a money laundering expert, but I was able to, to tell that these were transactions that definitely needed to be reported. Um, but I can tell you right now, it sounds like a very hard thing to do in three weeks, but I did it, and um, it's proven that I did it, because we're, we're here now. The question over here in the corner, Good, good question. Ever? Yeah. First, I commend you for being a whistleblower, because it takes a lot of audacity and moral fortitude to do it. Uh, but my you. next statement is, knowing that you're only there for three weeks, and that somehow you used the proprietary information, was your conscience bothering you? Because I know you had to have some factual documentation artifact to supply them to actually complete the report. No, uh, my conscience did not bother me at all. Because when it involves the national security of the United States uh, or saving American lives or um, something that, that 
is blatantly wrong, um, that supersedes all. And um, yes, there's, there's, it's, it's about the greater good. And if that meant I had to do something that was wrong, I guess you could say, by using proprietary information to help the greater good and to protect the United States of America, then so be it. And if I and and um, it was the right thing to do, and I stand by it. And I think most of the American public w would agree with me. Everett, you'll be around later today to answer questions as well. Yeah, of course. To be here through the uh, cocktail reception after we do our giveaways. So uh, please stick around, ask additional questions. Everett Stern, thank you so much for your time, for your insight. Thank you. Thank you.